introduce Rishab today. Uh, he got his PhD from Columbia University in 2021, and he is now a postdoc at Harvard, and is going to present his work on spectral universality, joint with Subhabrata Sen and ULU. Rishab, take it away. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rishab, and I'm sorry I couldn't join uh, in, in person. Uh, because of some visa issues, I'm not able to travel outside the US, but I am working on it and I hope I'll see uh, you folks in other workshops and conferences. Uh, um, so uh, today I'll talk about uh, uh, spectral universality in high dimensional estimation. So this talk is going to be about uh, an empirical phenomenon that uh, people observe in high dimensional estimation problems and um, some work I did with my um, postdoc advisor, Subhavrata Sen and uh, UALU to try and understand what's going on here. Uh, so uh, let me begin by introducing a canonical high dimensional estimation problem. Um, and so roughly speaking, the problem will involve recovering an unknown signal from noisy nonlinear measurements. So we, the way we are gonna set up the problem is that uh, there's this unknown signal beta star, uh, which is a vector which we would like to uh, recover and we observe uh, measurements y. Um, uh, and uh, the way the measurements are generated uh, um, is that uh, uh, the measurements are a function of the unknown signal. And this function is a composition of two parts. The first part is linear and is specified by a design matrix x. Um, and depending on which community you come from, you might also call it the feature matrix or the measurement matrix or the sensing matrix. And then there's a nonlinear part, which is like a link function, and it's a function from R to R, and it acts on the vector x beta star entry wise. And you might also want to model some noise in the problem, and so there's this epsilon. And so um, uh, many many in many applications where you want to recover unknown signals, you can cast the problem into a problem of this form. So for example, in MRI applications, uh, this g function is uh, just the linear function, identity function. Um, and then um, applications like X-ray crystallography, um, uh, this G is the square magnitude uh, function. Um, so uh, before I tell you about the empirical phenomenon, which is called spectral universality, let me tell you what universality means in a broader context. So, uh, so uh, when people say universality, they basically talk about, uh, they're basically talking about it's a high dimensional probabilistic phenomenon where, where what seems to happen is that many large stochastic systems uh, seem to behave uh, asymptotically the same, even though the exact constructions might be very different. Uh, so maybe, um, Uh, okay, so maybe, yeah, uh, one canonical example is the central limit theorem, which says that if you have a bunch of IID random variables with mean zero and unit variance, if you compute the normalized average, then it converges to a Gaussian distribution. And the limiting distribution is not sensitive to the exact distribution of random variables that you chose. And so that's why this is a universality result. Uh, yeah, sorry, somehow it gets, uh, my computer keeps getting free. Give me one second. Um, and uh, maybe even more striking examples can be found in random matrix theory. So in the three plots that I'm showing you, I'm plotting the eigenvalues of a large matrix. So this matrix is not symmetric, so it's I values are complex valued and so they have a real part and an imaginary part so i'm plotting a scatter plot of the real and the imaginary part uh the first one has uh the first matrix is a id gaussian matrix um the second matrix has id plus minus one entries and the third matrix is not random at all it's just populated with the digits of uh pi 
Um, and so the point is that the global behavior of the eigenvalues seems to be nearly the same in all the three cases that in the sense that the eigenvalues seem to be uniformly distributed on uh, the unit circle. Uh, and so, uh, so this is another example of universality. And so the question this talk is going to ask is, can uh, universality help us in high dimensional statistics? Um, so it turns out that uh, uh, a universality phenomenon that happens in statistics, which we call spectral universality. So I'll tell you about this phenomenon now. And again, the setup is going to be recover unknown signal from noisy nonlinear measurements. Um, and so um, uh, the universality phenomenon is going to be about the behavior of the design. So if someone gives you a design, you can always write down its SVD. So the U's are the left singular values, the sigma are the, uh, the U's are the left singular bases, the sigmas um, is a diagonal matrix of the singular values, and the V is the right singular uh, basis. And uh, what's frequently observed is that the statistical properties of the inference stars depend only on the singular values, only the sigma, uh, and the singular vectors are irrelevant if they are generic. Um, and by statistical properties, I mean the performance of your favorite signal recovery algorithm for this problem. And so what this means is that um, uh, if you have uh, two designs which have this, which share the same singular values, but have very different uh, singular vectors, um, then this sort of heuristic tells us that we should expect the two designs to behave the same. Um, and the reason why this is a heuristic is because there's this term I'm using that the singular vectors need to be generic, and I'm not really telling you what that what generic means right now. Uh, and so I'm not telling you when this principle will apply and when will it fail. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, so the example I want to share with you is this um, uh, is in the context of the lasso estimator. So it was uh, observed in these papers by Donohue and Tanner and Monajami at all. Um, and what uh, these folks did, they looked at the lasso estimator for uh, compressed sensing and they looked at uh, three different designs. The first one was the spike sign design, the random DCT design, and the hard design. And I'll tell you what these designs are. Uh, and they plotted the mean square error of the lasso estimator as you change the sparsity of the underlying signal. And what they found was that the three designs behaved exactly the same. So the green curves are for one design, the star curves are for the other design, and the red dots are for the other design. And it's not just that the mean square error of the lasso estimator was the same. They also, uh, you could also look at the histogram of the lasso estimator. Um, and even the histograms look basically the same. So it's as if the, the distribution of the lasso estimator was the same for these three very different designs. Um, and what maybe I'll tell you what these three designs were. So one of the designs was called the spike sign design. So this is a deterministic design, which consists of two blocks. The first, first block is the identity matrix, and the second block is the DCT matrix, the discrete cosine transform matrix. It's a deterministic orthogonal matrix. Um, the other design was the random DCT design. So the way this design is constructed is that you take a big DCT matrix. Again, that's just a deterministic orthogonal matrix, and then you pick some of its rows. Uh, the third design was an extremely random design. So what you do is that you sample a big random orthogonal matrix, a uniformly random orthogonal matrix, uh, and then you pick some of its rows. Um, and uh, uh, what's common among all these three designs is that they have the same spectrum, they have the same singular values, uh, but they have very different singular vectors. And out of these three designs, we sort of only know how to understand the hard design well. Uh, and so there's this work, which tells us a lot, gives us a lot of information about the behavior of the hard design. Um, and we sort of don't know much about these other two designs, but they behave exactly like the hard design. Um, and it's not just in compressed sensing. So uh, like the two applications I uh, mentioned in the beginning of the talk, for example, the compressed sensing I told you here, the most important design is the randomly row subsampled Fourier design. Uh, and in X-ray crystallography, there's a different structured design. Um, and this design is called the mass Fourier design. So each block is a Fourier matrix times a random diagonal matrix. 
Uh, and in both of these applications, uh, spectral universality seems to apply. And more generally, it seems to apply every time you have a very structured design. And by structured design, I mean, you know, uh, that it, sh it should have strong dependence and very little randomness, which makes such designs hard to analyze. But spectral universality seems to apply to such designs. Um, and I, sh I should also say that uh, this uh, phenomenon is not really about statistics. It seems to be a property of large stochastic systems because it's been observed in other fields like um, statistical physics in spin glasses and in communication systems. Okay, so uh, so okay, maybe I've convinced you that this phenomenon happens, uh, and uh, so why why so why is this why why should we care about it? And so the reason is that if we could sort of prove this thing happens, we could use this as a tool for analyzing systems that we can't understand directly. So uh, maybe what I mean by that is that suppose you're interested in a given inference problem, which has a design that uh, that's given to you. And uh, you might often not be able to understand the behavior of the inference problem with this specific design, because this design might have strong dependence or limited randomness. So think of the designs like the random DCT design or the spike sign design. Uh, uh, but using the spectral universality sort of heuristic, you can construct a surrogate inference problem, uh, which will behave just like the inference problem that you care about, but will be much easier to understand. Um, and so the way you construct your surrogate inference problem is that you take your uh, original design X and replace it by the surrogate design X tilde. Um, and the way you construct the surrogate design X tilde uh, is by uh, preserving its singular values. So X still and X have the same singular value sigma, but the singular vectors of X still are random. Um, they are random orthogonal uh, matrices. And so the exact definition of the uniform distribution on the orthogonal group is not super important, but just think of it as the most mathematically convenient distribution on, on singular vectors that you could possibly think of. And so if you uh, construct your surrogate design in this way, uh, thanks to the rotational invariance properties of the uniform measure on the orthogonal group, this design turns out to be easy to analyze. And there's like a lot of different tools that people like using to analyze this uh, rotational invariant design. And I have some references for some of the tools. Um, uh, but at the same time, if you believe in this spectral universality heuristic, because the surrogate design and the actual design that you care about, share the same singular values, you should expect the two problems to be e equivalent in high dimensions. And that's what happens. Um, OK. Uh, so, but, so let me quickly tell you about what's known about, what was known about um, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, this was first observed in the statistics literature by Donohue and Tanner. Um, and actually, Donohue and Tanner proved some of their, uh, give mathematical proofs of some of the empirical observations uh, in the context of noiseless compressed sensing. So this is a noiseless linear regression problem for the Lasso estimator. And uh, this, this is uh, like influential result, and it's really hard to beat this result in terms of the uh, generality of their assumptions. So their result applies to nearly deterministic matrices. Uh, but maybe the reason and why this result isn't really the end of the story here is because of the proof. So the proof, the way Don and Tanner proved their result was uh, using uh, some results from the theory of random polytopes. Uh, and the basic idea is that you can uh, pose the lasso problem as a linear program. And they were able to use some results known in the theory of random polytopes uh, to understand the behavior of uh, this universality behavior in the context of lasso. And in particular, the proof breaks down as soon as you add a little bit of noise to the problem. We kind of don't know how to extend their arguments. Or if you go beyond lasso to any other estimator, which cannot uh, be computed using linear programming. So it doesn't quite capture the full generality of the phenomenon here. Um, and then there's um, uh, like a there's a, a long line of work about Gaussian universality which basically says that if you have highly random designs, they often behave like Gaussian designs. Um, and there's a long line of work in this, uh, uh, in this direction. 
Um, and so by uh, highly random designs, I would mean uh, designs with IID entries or designs with independent rows. Um, and uh, what, what's great about these results is that uh, unlike the Donho or Tanner result, they're extremely general. So they apply to really very broad classes of inference problems. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the flip side is that Gaussian universality is not valid for structured designs that I'm talking about, like the spike sign or the random DCT design. So it's not that these designs behave like Gaussian designs, even in simulation. So they, are, they behave differently. Um, and then there's this third line of work, which is sort of uh, coming from uh, communication systems and uh, free, pro free probability. And so really, like maybe if I uh, speak in very rough terms, is that what they are interested in is understanding uh, the behavior of the spectral measure of a random matrix, which is constructed by adding or multiplying uh, matrices with generic eigenvectors. Um, um, and uh, uh, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's hard. Uh, yeah, but in sort of, uh, for example, it's hard to relate the performance of lasso estimator to uh, the spectral measure of some matrix. So it's not clear how. Uh, these results would help us understand what's happening in statistical applications. Okay. Um, okay, so before I tell you about our result, um, um, let me just recall what's the heuristic that we are trying to understand. So the empirical observation is that the statistical properties of the inference task depend only on the singular values of X. The singular vectors don't matter so much if they are generic, right? Um, and we would like to convert this heuristic into like a mathematical principle in the sense that we should be able to understand when should we expect this to happen and when should this expect we should expect that this doesn't happen. And in particular, we would like to understand what does it mean for singular vectors to be generic, uh, maybe have a precise mathematical definition of uh, generic. Um, and so I've been a little bit obsessed with this problem and I've written uh, Way too many papers on this, but I what I'll tell you about is the last paper I wrote with my postdoc uh, advisors, uh, ULU and Suvrata Sen, and I will also point you to this parallel work by Wang Zhong and Fan, which also un tries to understand this phenomenon under a different set of assumptions. Uh, okay, so let me tell you the setup uh, for the result. Uh, so the um, uh, so we look at a simpler problem. So this is just uh, maybe the canonical linear regression problem. So uh, uh, again, there's an unknown uh, uh, signal or parameter beta star that we would like to estimate. Uh, X is gonna be a design matrix or the feature matrix. Uh, and we observe the measurements or measurements Y and Y are a linear function. So it's X beta star plus noise. And we'll also assume that the noise is IID Gaussian. So we want to understand this phenomenon in this simple setup. Uh, and in particular, we, we will look at um, uh, regularized uh, least squares estimator uh, for this problem. So what these estimators do is that they, um, they're computed, at, they're given by the minimizer of a cost function. Uh, and this cost function has two parts. The first one is the, uh, squared uh, Euclidean distance between the actual measurements and the fit fitted measurements. Um, and then there is this regularization term, which you might use to promote some low dimensional structure on your estimate of beta star. For example, if you um, uh, um, uh, believe that your true beta star was fast, you might want to use the L1 regularizer here. But uh, in the theorem that I'll show you, the assumption is going to be that this regularizer is strongly convex. So it won't apply to lasso, but if you consider lasso with a small amount of bridge penalty, it would apply to, to that. Um, okay. Um, so here's the theorem that we proved. Um, and before I say the theorem, uh, I should preface it by saying that this is an asymptotic result in high dimensions. So remember we are trying to estimate a a parameter or a signal beta star, and P is the dimension of this signal that we are trying to estimate. And the result is a symptotic statement as P tends to infinity. Uh, uh, okay, give me one second. 
got frozen. It's got frozen again. Hmm. Okay. So uh, what the result says uh, is that um, so suppose you're given two designs uh, and the, uh, we impose some conditions onto two designs under which they'll be equivalent. Um, and the, right now I'm just calling them uh, the conditions as the two designs lie in the same universality class. And this phrase is a placeholder for three conditions uh, I'll tell you about in the next few slides. So there are these three conditions and the two designs have to satisfy these three conditions. And then we say that they lie in the same universality class. Uh, and I'll tell you what these three conditions are in a min minute. minute. And then uh, suppose that you uh, sample the unknown signal or the unknown parameter from an IID prior. So each coordinate of beta star, which is the signal that we wanted to estimate, is sampled IID from a prior pi. And then what you do is that you compute uh, the regularized least square estimator for the first design um, and the second design. So beta hat one is the regularized least square estimator for the first design. And beta hat 2 is the regularized least square estimator for the second design. Um, then what the result is claiming is that in high dimensions, um, the joint distribution of the first estimator computed on design 1 and beta star, uh, which is the unknown signal, is the same as the joint distribution of the estimator computed on design 2 and the, uh, uh, the unknown signal. And the um, sense in which this approximation holds is that if you take any um, pi, which is like a nice test function, it's a bivariate test function. And if you apply it to the coordinates of the first estimator and the unknown signal and average it across the coordinates, and you apply it to the second estimator and the unknown signal and average that across the coordinates, then the difference between the two is going to go to zero as the dimension goes to infinity. And really, you should think of pi as your favorite loss function. Like, for example, um, if you take pi to be the square loss, it would tell you that the mean square error of the two estimators on these two different designs um, is the same. But there's nothing special about the square loss. You could have taken other, other, other losses. Um, so, so that's the template of the theorem that we proved. Uh, but I still owe you an explanation about what I mean by uh, the two designs lie in the same universality class and what these three conditions are. So these three conditions, um, the first one of them is not very interesting. It just requires that x1 and x2 should have the same singular values in an approximate sense. And I, yeah, so that condition just says that. And it's not super interesting, but I think the other two conditions are more interesting. So I will focus on telling you about these other two conditions. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the, the, the second condition uh, is that the design should have generic singular vectors. And so this was also a condition imposed in the heuristic, but I didn't tell you what gen generic means. So this is a definition that we could come up with under which we could prove our theorem. And so I'll first tell you uh, what the condition is mathematically, and then I'll give you some intuition for it. So the condition imposes that for any integer k, if you look at the k power of the covariance matrix of your design, um, it should look like a rescaled uh, a scale. It should be a rescaled uh, identity matrix, and you are um, allowed an error of uh, one over root p, and then you have some. Typically, it's hard to verify this condition with one over root p, but you are allowed some slack, which is a polylog factor. And then it becomes easy to verify this condition. And also the way you are um, measuring your approximation error is this infinity norm, which is the entry-wise difference, ma entry-wise maximum difference between the two matrices. So entry-wise, the k power of any k any power of the covariance matrix should look like the identity matrix. Okay, so this is uh, this condition is a bit hard to pass, but the way I like to think about it is via this thought experiment which we call uh, a permutation invariant design. Um, so um, suppose 
So in this thought experiment, suppose you computed the, um, uh, you look at the covariance matrix of your design, and then you computed its um, eigen decomposition. So the lambda i's are the eigenvalues, and the ui's are the eigenvectors. And suppose for the purpose of the thought experiment that the eigenvalues are randomly matched to the corresponding eigenvectors. So the coupling between the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors is random, and it's given by a random permutation. Then you could uh, look at any power of the covariance matrix, and you could uh, argue by some concentration that it's going to concentrate entry-wise to the expected value of the kth power of the covariance matrix. And thanks to the random permutation, you could actually compute this expected value explicitly. And it's exactly a scalar multiple of the identity matrix, which shows up in the condition. Uh, so for this thought experiment, actually verifying this condition is almost like image eight. Um, and what I want to tell you is that this thought experiment is not super crazy because it, it already captures some interesting designs where people saw uh, uh, spectral universality. So for example, if you're picking um, random rows of the DCT matrix, one way you could do it is that you first shuffle the, all the rows of the DCT matrix and then pick the first few of them. So that's going to give you a random permutation. And this uh, random DCT design is exactly covered by this thought experiment. Um, and the same with when you pick random rows of a Haar matrix or a uniformly random orthogonal matrix, that's also covered by this thought experiment. But uh, but the point of these conditions is that you don't need uh, this random permutation to verify uh, for these conditions to be satisfied. And what these conditions do is that they uh, sort of capture this approximate decoupling between eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and what is nice about these conditions is that we were able to verify the set of conditions for, for all matrices that, uh, that were reported to exhibit universality in this work of monogamy at all, which was one of the works which um, uh, empirically found this observation. Um, and so in particular, I have some examples like ID matrices would satisfy this, and the left I, linear transformations of ID matrices would also satisfy this. Um, uh, the spike sign design I told you about satisfies this. Uh, and the mass Fourier designs, which are important designs for the space retrieval problem in X-ray crystallography, also satisfy these conditions. Um, okay. Um, so the last, the third condition I want to tell you about is the sign invariance condition. Um, uh, so the way I, I'm going to motivate this condition is by saying that just with the generic singular vectors condition. We know that it uh, even without without imposing further conditions, uh, uh, universality can fail. So, uh, uh, so in this plot, I'm again plotting the mean square error of the lasso estimator um, as I change the signal sparsity for the, the three different designs that Don Hardana studied. So they looked at the random DCT design, spike sign design, hard designs. So these three designs have the same singular values, and they satisfy the generic singular, the notion of generic singular vectors that I, I told you about. Um, and in the first plot, I, uh, I'm i plotting the performance, uh, the performance of the lasso when the unknown signal has been sampled from a prior, which is symmetric about the origin. Um, and in the second plot, I'm uh, doing the same experiment, but I um, sample the unknown signal from a non-symmetric prior. And in the second case, uh, you can see like departures from universality in the sense that the three designs don't behave uh, the same. Um, and this was also observed in this paper by um, Munajimi et al. Uh, they, they also observed when, for example, when the uh, unknown signal was completely positive, uh, they uh, started observing departures from universality. So to... Uh, bypass these cases where we know universality can fail, the condition that we impose is that the way you construct your design matrix is uh, by taking a deterministic matrix J. Now this J can be any matrix, but you randomly sign the columns of J. So these S1 through SP are random signs. Um, 
So it's not going to be uh, satisfied by, by the spike sign design because its columns are not randomly signed, but it's for a good reason because in some cases, this spike sign design does not exhibit universality. But as long as you randomly sign the columns of this spike sign design, it'll satisfy all our conditions. Um, and uh, that's really the only source of randomness in the design that we need to prove the theorem. So just be random signs in the design matrix. The other conditions are deterministic. Um, and maybe the point is that it's uh, much less randomness in as compared to other universality results that were known. Um, and it turns out that you don't need these random signings if there's some inherent sign symmetry in the problem. For example, if you're using a the signal is drawn from a symmetric prior, uh, or uh, and you're using an even regularizer, then which is an even function, then again you don't need. It's possible to do away with this assumption. And um, I think what's an interesting problem here is it would be great to sort of figure out um, a deterministic condition that replaces this sign invariance condition. So we know we know that we need another condition here, but we don't know what exactly this condition is, and this sort of this random signings is right now a placeholder for this future condition that we don't know right now what that condition should be. Um, okay, uh, so let me summarize. Uh, so what I told you about, about this in this talk was spectral universality. So roughly speaking, the phenomenon says is that um, the statistical properties of an inference task often depend only on the spectrum of your design and not the singular vectors. Um, and then I sort of, uh, in the context of regularized linear regression, I told you nearly deterministic conditions of the design under which you can expect this to happen. Yeah, and I guess that's fine. Yeah. Okay, question for Rishabh. So in the second condition for the universality class, you consider X transpose X. Uh, right. Is it important that this is the case? Why don't you look at X X transpose? Because this is saying something yeah. about right singular vector about X, but not left. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. So this is coming. This is something to do with the problem structure. So this uh, this theorem was about regularized linear regression. Right, uh, and in that problem, it turns out that you only need conditions on the right singular vectors. Uh, but if you look at more general problems, for example, like if you're uh, fitting a generalized linear model, uh, so your loss is not the square loss, but like a general loss, then you can prove a version of this theorem where you would have conditions on x transpose x, x x transpose, and there will also be some additional conditions uh, on. Uh, uh, on sort of incoherence between the left and the right singular vectors. Yeah, so so uh, yeah, so maybe that's the answer. To, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, yeah. More questions. Okay, I'll ask one. Um, could you say two words on what happens if the regularizer is not strongly convex, but just convex? Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Maybe this would be a little bit technical, but so the way we sort of uh, prove this result is by uh, um, uh, 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 writing down an iterative algorithm, which would solve the uh, uh, which would solve the uh, optimization problem that defines the estimator. So maybe you just write down gradient descent, and what we sort of need for the proof. Um, uh, to work is that gradient descent should converge in a constant number of iterations. And if the problem is not strongly convex, uh, 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 that might not happen. Um, and so, uh, uh, right, so, so, so that's why there's this strong convexity assumption. But, um, uh, and if it's not strongly convex, you would need to do an analysis which is case by case Right. For example, if, it, if the problem is not strongly convex, it's not even clear if the solution is unique. Right. Uh, so, like for example, for Lasso, you could probably try to do it, but it would have to be more on a case by case. From what I understand, there are no general conditions under which uh, 
people uh, would be able to tell you that, oh, oh the solution is going to be unique. And um, so the problem um, is not only the finite number of iterations, so it's also the fact that this may be not unique. Because if it's only the finite number of iterations, assuming the iterative algorithm is AMP, then you would try to do non asymptotics, no? You could do a non asymptotic uh, analysis like you do in random initialization. So there is some recent work on that. Oh, right, right. Uh, so, so, so I think I, I missed your question. So your question was, uh, is the problem only that you... So is the problem uh, that, the, that the surrogate algorithm that you are using to analyze uh, regularized linear regression uh, running for a fixed number of iterations independent of the ambient dimension, or is the problem that you have, yeah. uh, say, multiple fixed points, and so depending on where you initialize, you go there? Because the second problem I wouldn't know how to fix. For the first problem, maybe there is a way. Right. Uh, okay. So uh, <clears throat> maybe what I'll say is that uh, uh, um, so it's more of the first problem in the sense okay. that uh, 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 so that's uh, like so the the proof is method of moments and it's typically hard to do method of moments when uh, you have a diverging number of iterations. Um, and the other thing is that um, um, so in in problems like lasso, for example, for lasso for Gaussian designs, people know that EMP works in a constant number of iterations, but they know it because of some special properties of the lasso call, right? Okay. So that's what I'm saying. That um, uh, the main problem is uh, constant number of iterations, but in some depending on what the problem is, you might be able to get away with constant number of iterations by some by using problem structure. specific. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? I'm not sure whether my question can be like directly applied, but since you mentioned a few times a uh, connection to free probability, and uh, I know uh, that in free probability, um, um, in analogy to uh, the classical central limit theorem, if you sum up many free variables, then uh, you also find a limiting distribution. So I was wondering if you can use somehow these results uh, in order to find a condition on what this matrix X should satisfy to um, display some universality in the sense that um, maybe this matrix X is a random matrix, and if you take independent copies, then they are free. And then in that case, you would get this universality. I don't know. Can you make some connection like this? Yeah. So maybe I can't make connections to the result that you're the free central limit theorem that, that you're talking about, because that involves averaging l a large number of matrices, right? So here we just have uh, um, like one matrix, right? So, uh, and like if the matrix is like divisible, like a Gaussian matrix, you can sort of construct this matrix by averaging uh, several independent copies of it, but the matrices that we're looking at don't have this, this property. But what you could do is you could sort of make an analogy to other results in free probability, which says that, so for example, if you have um, two matrices, uh, um, uh, and you conjugated one of them with a Haar matrix, uh, then the two um, uh, matrices become freely independent. So you can characterize the spectrum of the any polynomial in those matrices, right? Um, so what you should, like maybe the analogy here is that uh, 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 the two matrices in our example would be uh, uh, like, for example, if you have a randomly subsampled DCT matrix, so one matrix is the DCT matrix, and the other matrix is a diagonal matrix with zero one entries telling you which which rows you sampled, um, and uh, uh, and somehow it turns out that these matrices are free without even uh, uh, conjugating by Haar matrices, um, uh, and uh, and it's uh, so so that's that 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 sort of that's the sort of results which were known in free probability because that's the sort of the third line of work that I mentioned that sometimes you can get freeness without conjugating by Haar Haar matrices. Uh, 
but uh, uh, right. And the other thing is that it's not clear in statistical problems that why uh, uh, how is Freenus going to help us? So Freenus is something about spectrum of polynomials, right? Uh, but in statistical problem, we're interested in uh, like for example the MSC of Lasso estimator, but how is it related to the spectrum of the matrix? So, but it turns out that uh, it's something like yeah, it's something to do with the behavior of all in pol of the polynomials polynomials in these matrices, which is sort of shared between the two. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if that made a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Any final questions? Thank you. Uh, I think the rotationally invariant AMP by Zofan derives a similar result. So I wonder if the, there is a difference between the, uh, the rotationally invariant AMP and this research. Uh, so not, uh, uh, right. So uh, yeah, so like the, the parallel work I mentioned by uh, Wong, uh, Jong, and Fan, uh, they, they look at uh, uh, like universality of, like a universality theorem beyond the rotationally invariant case. Mm -hmm. So even if your matrix is not uh, uh, rotationally invariant, sometimes it behaves like the rotationally invariant one. Uh, and they sort of looking at uh, when does this happen? So uh, yeah, so, um, so maybe roughly speaking, I can say that, um, uh, um, um, so we, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, the results are stated differently in the sense that uh, they like to put all their conditions on the matrix and we like to put some conditions on the matrix and some condition on the unknown signal, which is uh, which we assume is sample IID. So, but you can sort of transfer some of these, like imposing some conditions on uh, the signal is same as imposing some other conditions on the matrix. So if you do this transfer, then to make the comparison, I think the, compar the Paris comparison would be that uh, the results uh, those results are stronger in the sense that they don't assume that your unknown signal um, is from an IID prior, but they would require that the distribution of this unknown signal is permutation invariant. So that's the strength. Um, and the weakness would be that uh, on the design matrix, they would assume a stronger assumption. They would assume that, uh, they would essentially assume the uh, permutation invariant model that the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of the design are randomly coupled. Uh, so it's not going to be uh, satisfied for some of the designs that I told you about where there's no random permutation uh, coupling the matrices. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I think in the interest of time, we'll conclude here. Thank you, Risha Began.